The next presenter is a colleague of mine, is Audrey Willis, the Manager in Innovation and Performance Analysis here at Shelby County Government. And I'll let her go ahead and get started. All right, so um, good morning. It's still morning. I think we're on Tuesday. Um, I am presenting today, um, what's in your virtual tool bag? So um, part of my role um, as a manager of innovation and performance analysis um, is to look at uh, new ways and new procedures, um, specifically geared towards government. Um, but I've had the opportunity um, to serve as um, startups. And so um, I've had experience with different types of business models. So we will get right into this. Um, so with the next slide, um, one of the things I wanted to point out is that um, when we talk about what's in your virtual tool bag, the one thing I want you to pay attention to is that um, there are several organizations um, in our community that is very excited about helping you out with your business. Um, from the chamber to the city and county government, there are supplements um, available to help support you in your efforts. Um, we are well aware that the health of your business has a direct e economic uh, effect on the rest of us. So um, we're there to make sure your businesses thrive um, and you're successful. So with the next slide, let's talk about um, business model innovation. So um, it is a very unique um, type of business model um, that helps you kind of narrow, narrow your focus on um, what it is about your business that you should be looking at to innovate, to change, um, to maybe uh, reevaluate some pieces, to drill down into others. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is that e-commerce volume raised 47% like the last 30 days. So I know for myself, I have not interacted with anyone um, in a retail physical sense um, since we've been ordered to stay at home. I literally go from one garage to the other. Um, things are being put in my trunk, delivered to my door. So um, as businesses uh, start to look at what the business model of innovation is, um, I want you to think about um, how the new interaction of your customer is starting to look. So with the next slide, there's four different buckets that are there. Um, one is the reinventor. So that's typically having a business model already. Um, you're currently doing business and um, take, for instance, with a restaurant. Instead of having individuals physically come into your restaurant, you provide them with online ordering. Um, they call the same phone that they probably would have called before to make an online order, to go order, and they just pick it up from the curbside. Now, the difference is in between the reinventor and the adapter is the adapter is probably going to take one more step forward and instead of continuing to um, answer a new increased volume of phone calls to place to go orders, he's going to make it available perhaps on his website um, that instead of um, just the menu, you now have the option to tell the restaurant that you're going to pick up that order. Now, he hasn't changed his business model at all. Um, he's still uh, reinventing the business to now offer the restaurant pickup at the curb, but he's made it a lot easier for the customer to interact with him um, and, and also be able to take an influx of volume and not have to reallocate his customers. Now, um, the other two kind of lend themselves to creating new businesses within your business. Um, the Maverick, um, I want to give the example of uh, the sudden increase of making facial masks or facial coverings or alternatives to PPE. It's a new business um, and it's not necessarily uh, taking away from a current business. You could be a tailor that has a current skill to be able to um, sew and you have materials on hand. Um, you're just simply adding to. Um, but the adventurer is the more aggressive. Um, I kind of always think about like the Facebook model of um, seeing something that I'm capable of doing and going and attacking and conquering that. So that adventure is going to be someone that perhaps um, I'm a wedding seamstress and now I'm going to make PPE that um, matches or coordinates with my wedding party. So when you're looking at your businesses and how we're going to reopen these situations, um, keep in mind that your business is not going to be the same it's never going to be the same as it was. And what your offerings are have to um, align with what new um, guidelines and recommendations are. Um, I've been hearing buzz about there's no longer gonna be any buffets 
or um, different cities are requiring um, you to not have um, a cutlery rolled in napkins. So the rules are going to change. Um, the advice is that you continue to stay nimble to, um, to adapt when the business models start to change. So the next slide, we're going to talk about tools. Um, some of these tools have been out there. Some of you guys have been using them for years, but um, I can almost assure you that nobody's been um, as reliant as you're going to be on tools as you are now. Um, a lot of your businesses are transitioning to stay at home models. Um, I know it seems overwhelming. There are tons of tools out there um, and I know lots of tutorials, um, but just know that there's free options, low cost options. Um, and so the next slide, um, just talking about, uh, go back one more, uh, setting up shop. Now this is more so towards individuals that um, are looking at adding to their business that's currently functioning or um, expanding businesses that are currently functioning. So this, um, and I know you can't see it in great detail, but the only thing that I want you to look at is that huge spike. So within Google Trends, um, which is a, a free system, all I did was type in the search for face masks. So along that trend line, no one was looking at face masks at all. And suddenly, about 45 days ago, there was a huge spike. What this tells me is that there's a huge uh, now uh, demand for face masks. And so the trend um, searching for face mask is starting to kind of taper off. So um, what that also tells me is that there is some demand that's being met or some need is being met that it's, it's kind of started to taper off. Google Trends is a really great tool because it tells you a lot about um, what you're searching for, what um, is missing from your business or, or what you can add to your business. It tells you, um, details of what additional searches may have accompanied that, um, but it is a great tool to determine the need in the market. Um, the next one. So a couple of website tools, um, like I said, a lot of businesses and organizations have always had websites, but you have not been dependent on websites. Um, if you go to a website and it's not attractive, somebody's going to move on. Um, so a couple of tools that are there to make your websites look better. Canva, I am a um, advocate of Canva uh, till they take it away. Um, it is a free tool. You can use it to make uh, graphics, uh, flyers, uh, Instagrams, uh, banners for your Facebook page. There are tons and it's almost limitless. Um, I will say this, um, one thing, um, a lot of organizations had not been required as far as like salons and service um, companies, they would have like an online feature that would require you to make an appointment. Um, it's going to be more and more important um, to have those appointments now that um, some of the phases in reopening our economy is going to be um, uh, schedule based or appointment based. Um, some of these tools, um, and I'm going to share out the links as far as like your websites um, have inputs where you can attach um, free scheduling modules. So um, if you weren't 100% reliant on your website, you're going to be now. Make sure your website is easy to use for um, your customers coming in. Um, one thing uh, I'll point out, uh, I go to a, a certain retailer that uh, makes sales all the time. Um, it is as simple as putting an option to have a pickup versus a delivery option there um, that will save you tons of um, time and resources because your employees are not having to answer phones or um, answer emails about um, orders that are coming in. It's just the little things that we have to um, look at evolving in our business processes. So the next thing, uh, running your business, uh, QuickBooks is always a go-to. Um, everyone that's in listening ears should already be keeping good records of your businesses. But um, one thing that we have found um, in applying for the grants and the loans that have come out, um, a lot of us haven't been good record keepers. Um, so I will say QuickBooks is most certainly a, a free-ish version. Um, and I'll make sure the links are available there. The next one, running your business, um, 
managers were still keeping and are still keeping schedules written on bulletin boards in the back. Um, we have to move away from assuming that people are coming in and reading bulletin boards to get announcements from us. Um, Asana is my preferred uh, tool of choice. Um, there's ways to go in, manage projects, manage schedules, um, to be able to communicate with your employees on where they should be going, what projects they should be working on. Um, we have to figure out a way to manage our brick and mortar employees outside of our brick and mortar. And Asana is a tool, um, it's free based um, for small businesses. If you're looking at 15 people to a project, it's a good tool to use. Um, the next one is customer service. Um, in my opinion, there's never a tool uh, as good as plain old customer service. Picking up the phone, responding to an email, telling a customer thanks for your support, leaving a note in a, in a food order saying thanks for supporting a small business. Um, nothing is better than that. But if you do need a customer service tool, um, Zendex is a great one. It's a um, service first CRM system, um, customer relationship management system. And so it kind of streamlines all the ways you contact your customer um, into one platform. So if you're on the phone, if you're emailing them social media, it's all streamlined into one platform. Um, and you can monitor um, your customer's interaction a little better there. So the next one is marketing. Um, like I said, we have to reevaluate the way we're contacting our customers. Marketing is going to be one of them. Um, how you're marketing, where you're marketing, um, having a billboard, assuming that people are driving by it um, is long gone because we're all supposed to be um, in shelter in place. So we have to think about new ways that we're uh, soliciting our business. Are we partnering with individuals? Um, one thought that came to mind was like, um, we have uh, restaurants that partner with organizations like Grubhub. They're requiring us to now seal bags to ensure that there's no food tampering. Well, did you put your restaurant logo on that sticker? Um, if you're going to reopen your restaurant soon and it's going to be required that you have to have um, facial coverings or PPE, are you putting your logos on those? Um, are you properly preparing um, your company to make sure you're in line with marketing when we become open again? Um, so the next thing is measuring results. I am a, a data person, so um, make sure you are keeping track of what's working and what's not working. So Google Analytics um, has several, several options where you can uh, simply embed um, HTML tags, little coding tags into your website on different pages to determine um, where your customers are actually going. Um, it's important to look at that because if you notice that your customers are um, ordering through um, a third party customer more than they're ordering directly through you, maybe you need to reallocate your resources that way. So um, like I said, Google Analytics is probably one of my favorite free tools. Um, it spits out dashboards in order for you to be able to use. Um, it also plugs into like some of your social um, media pages and things so you can determine like what is your, your customer's core need um, and see it highlighted in different types of word clouds and stuff and things of that nature. So with all that, um, I am, at the end of my presentation. So um, if you have any questions, I am uh, here and able to answer questions. All right, thank you so much for that helpful information. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of good tools there for small businesses to use to kind of step their game up in this new time. Uh, we're gonna go to the questions now. As I said before, raise your hand to be, asked, be able to ask a question. And we're starting with Mr. Ross. Hello, Audrey. Um, hey. Thank you. I am... Um, looking for your information, that slide, it, it, it passed so fast, I didn't see it. I would like to see that. <laughs> okay, thank you. And I, um, I'll make sure, there's a, a much, much longer list of um, different tools that are free or close to free that can be used. And I'll make sure um, I provide that link at the end of this call. All right, go ahead, Chelsea. Uh, do you have any recommend? Hi. <laughs> do you have any recommendations for um, scheduling apps that can be easily integrated into websites or 
um, maybe not an app, but like, you know, some sort of service. Oh, yeah. So um, Wix, which is kind of like my web page builder of choice, they have these little widgets, which are really easy to just drag and drop into your website. Um, most website builders like GoDaddy and Squarespace, all of them um, have some type of version of it. My advice is always use what you already have and just expand on it. Um, and they have modules where you can just drop them into your a new page in your website to, to start um, scheduling things. And so um, it is in my opinion that as we kind of move towards a new normal, it's going to be extremely important to be able to keep track of those um, schedules. As far as like liabilities, um, you don't want like uh, code enforcement coming saying, you know, we have to shut your operation down because you've got too many people there. And at least you'll have documentation that states you know, I've only scheduled for 10 people to be in my facility um, at any given time. You know, maybe those people are loitering. I mean, it, it just provides so much security for you to be able to say, hey, I know I have 10 people that are supposed to be in my facility today and we can plan appropriately for it. All right, we got Linda P. Linda? I think she's on mute. Yeah, she might have to unmute. Okay. She is. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Uh, yes, I, I know most of this discussion is regarding um, businesses, but I have a nonprofit and it, it focuses on children. Mm -hmm. Since this is about going forward, I'm interested in, um, I, since I'm dealing with this group that is the least likely to be infected, the least likely to be carriers, uh, according to the latest science that I've heard, uh, I'm considering for the summer giving some relief to the parents and, and open the, opening back up my program. But I'm wondering what liability would I be taking on? Um, should children have to wear PPE or just should make sure that the adults are wearing the PPE? Um, should we be outside or uh, just make sure that I, mean, I have plenty of room to put uh, family groups, children who are part of the particular family group at individual tables. Um, I'm just wondering about moving forward, since this is about the new normal and moving forward, and how to continue what you've been doing. Um, um, well, I guess I'll put on my nonprofit hat. Um, I'm a co-founder of the nonprofit co-crew. And so um, one thing we have done, and, and I am so grateful for our team and um, MAKA's executive leadership, um, we have gone to all online classes um, for the time being um, to ensure that we are um, being safe with children, um, with their families, because uh, we're at, we typically would interact with children on a daily basis. And I know um, there hasn't been any recommend, recommendation, um, but there have been guidances on um, children and PPE um, I would just say, and, and I am no um, health department um, official, but I would say tread lightly and with caution because when you're talking about um, engaging with children, it's not just that child, it's all the children he or she interacts with, is um, who they interact with when they go home, so that multiplies. Um, so I would just say uh, tread lightly, but um, also look at what online programming looks like. Uh, one of the things that we're doing at CoCrew is um, we partner with SCS, and so we've been integrated into their um, television programming. So um, take, for instance, we'll be doing tech demos um, with SES, but it's keeping kids engaged and looking at a new way to engage the children. So um, I would just say I wonder, if, I wonder, I wonder if Todd has any guidance on the topic real quick. One minute. And I, I apologize. I was I was looking for these articles, Andre, and uh, and multitasking and doing a very bad job at that. Um, can Real you orient quick, me on, on the question? The question came from a, the owner of a childcare facility who is looking to open up, but wanted some guidance on how to do so safely, uh, specifically with regard to uh, the kids in the facility, PPE. What 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 should be what should be considered in that case? Okay. Yeah, that's a great question, um, and, and you know, and certainly this is going to be something that's that's 
going to be governed in part by the, the phased approach to uh, to opening up um, businesses that uh, uh, the, the mayors uh, ha- have been outlining um, this week and I, and I think is still in development. And, and forgive me, but I, I don't know which phase the uh, the child care uh, area would, would, would fall in under the new local guidance. Um, that being said, uh, I, I think you, you need to constantly be looking at the CDC's website. Uh, I, I know the issues of school and child care and, and that sort of thing are very much emerging topics from a science standpoint, trying to marry the thought that uh, that while these, these children are, are sometimes less susceptible to COVID-19, they can still become latent carriers and bring that home to to parents and, and, and grandparents and others. Um, and, and there's you know, often really an inability to effectively socially distance uh, those, you know, those children that are, that are at a, a child care facility. Uh, that being said, I think I'd be, I would be thinking about how you might be able to socially distance, um, you know, maybe limiting the number of employees, or, I'm sorry, well, employees, but also children uh, thinking about uh, safe precautions and procedures for uh, drop off and pick up, uh, thinking about um, what measures you're taking to uh, make sure that the empl- that the uh, children who are coming uh, to the the child care facility are uh, are well uh, in terms of their temperature, you know getting releases from from parents for uh, for that sort of thing. I think that's helpful not only to protect the other children, but also from a marketing standpoint um, for the other parents to ha- that, are, that are bringing their, their children there and part of that community uh, to have a sense of, um, you know, of, of shared social responsibility. Um, you know, the employees, I'm sure, are going to want to be wearing face masks and, uh, and, uh, and gloves where possible. Um, you're going to want to have repeated training of those employees, uh, making sure that that wipes and, uh, and other disinfectants are readily available, uh, making sure that as part of the curriculum for the children, that the children are being consistently and constantly reminded of the um, the importance of personal hygiene and some of the basics. Um, uh, and, and that sort of thing. So uh, it's, it's kind of a broad answer. I apologize, but I hope that that helps somewhat. Thank you very much. And our last question for the session is going to be from Teresa. Okay. Hello. I think that probably this message is more for Todd. Um, but while we have online capabilities, we've got uh, video capabilities. What do you advise as far as some of the um, contract employees that we, well, contract workers whom we have who are not employees? Uh, I want to make sure I'm understanding the question in terms of, it sounds like, um, it it sounds like uh, you're asking whether or not contract employees can be allowed to appear remotely for work or I want to make sure I'm understanding it um, I, as well as I can. I'll, I'll, I'll recap and broaden a little bit. We've gotten a, a, a couple of questions about uh, contract employees and whether, whether or not some of the things that we've discussed, uh, some of the protections and programs that we've discussed apply to contract employees as well as traditional employees. I see, I see. Um, so, and, and this is something that I'd want to look into for you a little bit further as it, as it does go beyond the scope of, of, of this planned uh, uh, you know, this, this planned training session. But generally speaking, um, the FFCRA provides that independent contractors would not be counted in terms of the 500 employee limit to qualify. You know, as Paul mentioned, um, for these you know, FFCRA protections, the, the paid sick leave and, and so forth, it's uh, and the expanded FMLA leave, uh, it's only available to employers to, 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 or to, to employers with, with under 500 employees. Uh, there is a theory that some of these protections could actually apply in terms of, you know, paid leave for independent contractors. 
Um, it's, it's a little bit complicated of a process to get there, but uh, there, is, there is some uh, theory uh, that it could be made available to the, the quote unquote gig worker. Uh, but that's, that's probably a topic that uh, um, it warrants a little bit further discussion and, and it's really a fact specific issue. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for, to all of our participants. Thank you to our, our partners in this event, the Greater Memphis Chamber. Uh, thank you to everyone who attended and asked uh, great questions. They really got the discussion going beyond the presentations themselves.